Welcome to this podcast is making me thirsty. The number one destination for Seinfeld fans. This is episode 100. And to mark this special occasion, we have a very special guest today. He was the first guest we ever spoke with who was associated with Seinfeld. He has written more episodes of Seinfeld than anyone except Larry David. He wrote 21 Seinfeld episodes, including The Virgin, The Visa, The Implant, The Hamptons, and the yada yada. He was a producer and writer from seasons two through season nine. We're super excited to have him join us for a second time for our 100th episode. Please welcome Peter Melman. Peter, thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Yeah, happy. I actually wasn't there for season nine. Oh, yeah. It's just what we talked about the last time. You were credited, though, with writing uh, a few episodes. Yeah, I wrote a couple episodes anyway, but yeah, I wasn't on the staff then. (laughs) Well, your your presence was felt. Let's put it that way. But well, happy birthday to us! And look at that. Peter's got a beautiful mug, um, celebrating that. So, Peter, <laughs> yeah, there it is. So, Peter, you, um, it's been a fun ride since we last spoke. You were our uh, our first person we spoke to from Seinfeld, being a writer and actor. And since then, we've spoken to over sixty from the show. Um, wow. Thanks to you. So, we just wanted to thank you for that, and it's been. Um, it's been such an experience because, I mean, you kind of set the tone and we've learned a great deal, not only from your episode, but from all, all these, you know, 60 plus guest stars, writers. Yeah. I, I've spoken to a couple of guys who told me they had a really good time talking to you guys. <laughs> yeah. One, I'm probably one of the, you know, we love talking to the writers, whether it's your buddy, Bill Masters or, you know, Matt Goldman, Mark Jaffe, I think, you know, getting a sense of how a writer develops a show and develops these characters, I think is, was key to its, key to its success. Um, so I'd love to just get your thoughts on kind of just writing for the show and the camaraderie you've had with other writers, like, like a Bill Masters and how you guys are still friends today. Well, Bill and I were best of friends, be, uh, you know, like long before the show. Well, oh, wow. by 1987, I actually did a story. Bill was a comedian. And that, <clears throat> excuse me, there was a big comedy boom in the 80s. And um, the Washington Post magazine got a new editor and they asked me to, you know, come up with some stories to do. And um, I just thought it would be great to travel on the road with a road comic. You know, back then they were like all these road comics, you know, they would, they'd play you know, some venues that were great, you know, like I traveled with Bill and he played this great venue in Hilton Head and another really great one in Asheville. And then, you know, like we were in um, two places in Georgia that were, you know, one of them was, (laughs) was like this hotel and they were hosting a PTL convention. So, uh, they didn't really go for the humor that much, but it, it was a, it was a fascinating trip. And, you know, like we had known each other before that, but you know, we had such a blast doing it that, um, you know, we stayed very close all this time. Yeah. And you know, we, we like Ohio Bench, we talked to so many guest stars, you know, since we've talked to you and we obviously try and bring up people that we've talked to when we have guests on we, we talked to Suzanne Cryer, who had nothing but nice things to say about you, said you were brilliant and, and, and loves you. And, uh, you know, she said to us that you told her that the yada yada was going to be a big episode, the one she was in. You, you kind of like were trying to tell her, like, it's going to be big. Um, I'm curious because you had so many of these of these episodes with these these phrases like double dip or shrinkage or yada yada, you know, low flow uh, on the shower heads or real and spectacular. I mean, it's they go on and on. Right. How did you, number one, kind of, I guess, come up with them? Did you kind of test other words and other things in your own mind? Did you bounce it off people? Was there sort of like a trial and error there? And then kind of number two, how did you know, you know, when one was going to hit? Or was it kind of just just kind of luck or you, you never really did know? I don't know. But it's it's funny that you did mention that you did say Yada was going to be big. Um, for the most part, it happened differently on, on every one. Um, to answer your second question first, I never knew that any of them would like catch on like that. In fact, in the yada yada episode, there was also the um, situation with the anti dentite. Oh right! And I kind of thought that would come up. I thought that would be like a big one. 
But, um, you know, for the most part, you know, you're not trying to, you know, create a catchphrase that's going to, you know, you just have a situation and you don't have a real English term for that, for that situation, you know, so, you know, double dipping a chip. I mean, you know, when I had that idea, you know, coming up with the phrase double dip was no big deal. Um, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, sponge worthy, you know, that, that was good. <laughs> I like that one. And, yeah, uh, and, and yada, yada was, you know, yada, yada wasn't, didn't fit into that category of needing a word. That was the story, right? you know, that, you know, and, you know, I had never heard anyone say that in 10 years. I came up with yada, yada because of a lunch with an editor in 1998 in New York. And she had said yada, yada several times. And it was very strange. And I was, you know, like, huh, that's what, a, what an odd little thing. And then I barely thought about it, and then it came back to me, you know, eight, nine years later. Well, uh, yeah, um, yeah, basically eight years later. And um, I guess I said, you know, there's something there. Yeah, it's, it's funny. Suzanne, uh, well, she actually thought the anti itself would take off, I think, to your point, more than the yada yada. But um, – yeah, so yada yada, like multiple people said that. And we, we talked last time and we talked about how there were some challenges writing for even Jerry and Kramer. Sometimes you'd write Kramer stuff for Jerry and et cetera. So I'm just curious, like, unlike the double dip, for instance, like that had to be George, right? You, you couldn't have written that for, for any other character, could you, could you have? Um, no, I, I think, I mean, you know, it worked best for George, but... I mean, you know, now that I think about it, you know, like if I had given it to Elaine for some reason, it could have blown her whole situation. Yeah, it's kind of like exclamation yeah. point thing with her or something like that. You know, and he, I mean, even Jerry probably could have, you know, but, um, you know, I, I, I don't know if it would have worked great for Kramer. But, you know, he probably would have figured out a great way to act it out. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, we've heard that about Michael Richards. He was he was he was great at. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe even you told us that, or I forgot. One of the writers told us. You know, if, I think it was you actually. You said like if you just if you would give him a Jerry story, thinking it was just kind of a mundane thing, and then he would turn it into something. Once you figured that out, it was like that, that, that took me like four years to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> um, is it true while we're talking about some of your episodes, the shower heads? I, I have two questions on this one. One, I read that you had actually pitched that idea earlier on, um, like years before it actually aired about the low flow shower head. A and then number two, if that is true, like how often that happened? How often did you sort of recycle or repitch something that maybe Jerry and Larry didn't want the first time and then they, they kind of came back to it later on? Were you uh, always kind of storing them up? That was really the only time that happened. <laughs> but, um, you know, there was another thing that was funny. You know, like, I, I forgot what episode. I think it was, ugh, I forgot what episode it was in. But, you know, the thing where Elaine doesn't want to talk to somebody and she pretends that she's, you know, in her car. Like, the she wants to talk to a girlfriend and her boyfriend is constantly picking up the phone. So she just uses a hair dryer and makes it sound like she's in the phone, on the yeah, phone. Yeah. I had had that idea set. I had put that into a couple other scripts in certain ways, and uh, it never really worked. I think I just wore them down on that one. <laughs> so, and we've talked to a lot of writers, some that were just there for one episode, and kind of what we've learned is they came up with a concept, but when push came to shove, Larry kind of rewrote everything. I know you touched on that a little bit, but did that happen a lot with you or did you kind of have final say? Cause you were kind of one of the more established guys. I didn't have final say at all. It was always Larry and Jerry who had final say. And, um, it definitely happened to me a few times. I mean, you know, it really took, it took a while to just get the hang of the whole thing. You know, and for me, especially because I hadn't really writ written scripts before. 
So um, it's weird, though. In my, you know, in in the fourth season, you know, the implant was probably the most unrewritten script that they that ever went through to Jerry and Larry. You know, that one was like in great shape right you now it took no work and everything it was great and mm. you know a couple of scenes and it was like the first time that the couple of scenes that they wanted to that they had different ideas about they just came in and said rewrite this scene in this way normally they would rewrite it but they just let me rewrite it so that was really great so so how did it work i mean i know you mentioned earlier you weren't on staff in, in season nine but you were there season eight and I, I'm a, I'm just curious, um, as someone who was there for, you know, from, from two all the way through eight, you know, you, you, how, obviously everyone that listens to our podcast knows we're partial to the earlier years, you know, two through five, basically. Um, and, you know, obviously six is great too, but anyway, uh, the point is without Larry there, how did that whole process change in, in season eight? And did, as you being sort of a veteran, um, of the show were, were you at all asked to kind of be part of that Larry role as far as helping out the other writers or were you kind of just did your own thing? It was like, I'm out of here after this anyway. Cause I, I, I mean, we, we don't want you to disparage anyone, but I, I'm getting the sense that you weren't as fond of the later years either maybe. And maybe because of the process, I'm not sure, but maybe you kind of uh, touch on that. That year, you know, it became much more of a group effort. You know, it wasn't, you know, there was, you know, I mean, Jerry was still kind of about, you know, the top guy, but, you know, he had so much between the writing and everything, you know, he just, and then acting and everything, it he had so much going on that, you know, he, you know, it, it got to be more of a group effort. And I would say, not that I have great, reg any really huge regrets about it, but, you know, I was always... A person who just wrote alone and looking back I think that I probably should have just said to Jerry look I can't be exactly Larry but you know I think I'm the one who could come closest so I you know and I didn't do that and I probably should have mm. I, hmm. but, you know, I mean it would have made it probably would have made it a lot tougher because you know there were a lot of stories that you know, if they were up to me, I wouldn't have la You know, I wouldn't have done them. Like right. the muff, <laughs> like the muffin tops. <laughs> <laughs> that was. I think that was after. Oh, was that in the eighth? Was that uh, in season? I don't remember yeah. that one. Yeah, just, eight nine. I just gets a little fuzzy. I just thought it was kind of like a silly idea, and yeah, you know, and she got into that idea with Mister Lipman, right? Yeah, Richard Fancy. Yeah, you know. Yeah, it was eight. End of season eight. I didn't like, you know, once Elaine was gone from Pendant Publishing, you know, whenever Lippman was in, I was just like, it, it doesn't. He doesn't seem like him anymore. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, I can see that. Right. You, you did. You did stay true to the. I mean, a lot of your later episodes, you did bring back. Um, you know, the parents a lot. You used Clompus. Um, you know, with the money episode, um, you kind of called back to the pen, I believe in that episode. I mean, you, you kind of kept that theme. I mean, even, even your, your season, the episodes sort of still had the, the feeling of, of the, uh, of the earlier years because of that. Um, yeah, yada, 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 was actually a really, you know, kind of like the kind of thing that could have worked in season right, three. Exactly. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Excellent, uh, point. Yeah. And also Newman, I mean, you did use Newman a lot. I felt like, I don't know if we talked about that last time, but, um, you know, Newman is, is, is sprinkled all over the soulmate. He's big in the shower heads. He's big in, um, you know, the scoff law is a, is a major, major Newman, uh, story. Um, you know, I'm curious. Episode. What's that? Not a great episode, the Scott Law. I didn't love that one. <laughs> well, that's where George gets the piece, though, right? Yeah. I mean that 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 was part that helped, but so let's touch that. I guess touch on that. What uh, what what else? You seem to be critical, even of your own episodes. Um, you know, yeah. what what were the ones that uh, when they didn't hit the mark? In hindsight, what do you, what do you attribute it to? Um, 
I don't know. It was just like sometimes you think, you know, you got a good concept and, you know, and somehow you can't quite make it work. And, uh, you know, you end up going to a bit of an extreme at times. And, uh, you know, I didn't like doing that, you know. So, and, you know, I remember episodes, you know, even, even if the scoff law turned out great, I wouldn't feel good about it because I didn't do a really great job on that episode, you know. From a variety of perspective, you thought that. We ranked at 64, by the way. I just throwing it out there, the staff law. What is it? Is that all writing or is that directing? Is it guest stars? Like, Obviously, I remember you told us you kind of pulled Love It out of the blue on that one. Yeah, it's all writing. You know, it's always It's all writing. writing. Yeah, and you mentioned yeah. the, the implant, you know, was was nearly perfect right off the bat, um, yeah. you know, untouched. And I've heard, you know, whether it's songwriting or pretty much any writers usually say um, the best things are kind of written almost fast, like they just come right out. And there's no, there's not a lot of, you know, like you mentioned, like kind of, you know, tinkering with it to try and make it fit. Maybe that's where some of these things go off the rails. There's a million ways it can go off the rails. You know, you could you just make you make a choice of what happens in the second speed of a story, and then you know, like a week later, you realize that was like the wrong way to go, and you're kind of stuck with it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you were, and you were, you were tough on the Good Samaritan as well. I remember what missed there in your mind was it like I don't know. Uh, you're so good looking. What were some of the pieces you didn't like about that? Um, no, I like the good, you're so good looking and the sneer, you know, like him saying, you know, which was kind of a, which was a, a total Larry idea. Um, I, I think, you know, like this, I just didn't like where the story ended up with, um, with Jerry and the girl who, you know, he, he was going to confront her because she clipped some other car. Yeah. Right. And I Melinda, the, Melinda McGraw. Yeah. I love the beginning, but um, I don't know. She seemed like she went a little, she, she was a little, <laughs> she, she was like the character just got like, <laughs> like she was an unbelievable, horrible person, which maybe that was the way to go. Yeah, we're uh, we're talking to her in a couple of weeks, actually. So I'm curious to get her take. But yeah, no, that you know, oh right, 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 right. I think a that guy. episode. Oh. Yeah, we're gonna be talking to her soon. Um, I mean, a lot of your your episodes had some major guest stars. Some of them weren't weren't major yet, but um, you know, Terry Hatcher, Jennifer Coolidge, Courtney Cox, Deborah Messing. Um, they're all were in your episodes. Um, yeah. How much, I'm not sure if we actually this last time, but, uh, you know, we did talk to Mark Hirschfeld, but how much as the writer on an episode, were you involved at all when it came time to, to casting? Um, or was it usually just Larry and Hirschfeld in the room? No, 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 very, very much. Um, you know, I, when you write, when, when you write an episode, you're in on the casting. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Um, you know, I think one person, one one woman came in for uh, the role of Sidra in um, in the implant, and and I guess she was okay. I don't remember exactly, but um, I think Mark Mark said something like, "How about Terry Hatcher?" And way too fast, I said, "Yes." <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's the funny thing is, like two weeks earlier. I was having dinner with Bill Masters in um, in Hollywood, and she was at a table, to you know, like two tables over. And oh my God, I was like, oh my God! And uh, yeah. well, that was before Lois Lane, right? I mean, she yeah. wasn't, you know, Terry Hatcher then, you know. But I feel like a lot of the the a lot of the people you and may she rest in peace, Tony Katayan, who we've we've had on the show. She was probably one of the most established or well known that was in your that was in your episode. Yeah, um, but you know, as far as the others, Courtney Cox, Jennifer Coolidge. So you, so you kind of pretty much handpicked these. Well, I mean, actresses. You know, we would talk about. We would, you know, we would sit there writing notes. 
and um, and discuss it. And, you know, it was funny because if the first person to audition, if there were like six people coming in to audition for one part, the first the first one, if they were any good, they kind of set the bar. And then you go, the second one, you go, well, not as good as the first one. Or, wow. And, you know, uh, you know, and yada, yada, um, <laughs> she just came in. She was last. You know? Mm. Uh, Suzanne, yeah, she about that. Suzanne Cryer was, abs- was the last person she read who read, and she just completely blew everybody out. It wasn't wasn't even close, but you know, with um, you know, with like Courtney Cox, you know, she was a known quantity then, and you know, she's not going to audition. You know, certain people, mm. you, know, you know, even even um, Terry Hatcher at that point, you know, she wasn't as big as she would eventually become, but she was re- really well known, and she was not going to audition. You know, she that was called offer only. Oh, interesting. Um, college she she auditioned you know but she wasn't that big then. you know you, you mentioned the implant um you know the script of the implant obviously is is perfection um your all of your season four episodes are amazing i mean the virgin's amazing the visa's amazing the implant although the smelly car i think i've admitted i'm not a huge fan of the smelly car but um i know you wrote that with larry but anyway the other four, the other ones season four has the arc you know it has the whole um show within a show and um you know your episodes; they they tie very closely together. I mean, you know, the Virgin and the and the uh, the contest are you know basically tied together. Um, how much you know did Larry tell the staff about the arc and how to fit it in, and, and like how did you know you know when to kind of have them go into the NBC office? How much did Larry get involved in that? It seems like a Not, lot to to kind of tackle. He didn't really tell us at all. Okay, so he was making those changes after the fact, sort of. Uh, we, you know, you know, I would, I said to him, you know, like, what if George? I, I pitched an idea that George would like go into a meeting when he's been dating Susan. He'd go into a big network meeting, and when they were saying goodbye at the meeting, he would kiss her, and she'd get <laughs> fired. And. Um, so, you know, that's how it would happen. The, the The Virgin story was actually just like really lucky that it just so happened that in that same episode, I was right. I, you know, I had the Virgin story and, you know, that was all based on that one scene where, you know, I wanted Elaine to talk about like how her, her you know, you just find out, yeah, you just find out that this girl's a virgin, then Elaine pops then starts talking about nonstop about her diaphragm. And, um, you know, the fact that the Virgin just happened, that was luck. That was really good luck that I, you know, because Larry could plug it in so easily right into the next episode. And that was amazing casting as well um, with the Virgin. Jane Leaves. She became pretty yeah. good. So th- those episodes, season four, for the most part, you wrote solo um another one of our favorites the hamptons right with carol lee i'm just curious did you enjoy like to tell us a little bit of the difference between writing it solo and pitching it versus kind of a combo deal with, with carol um you know like who, like who, wrote, who wrote what right who, who kind of set the tone there i'm just curious how that that whole dynamic works you know, I, I kind of did most of the writing. We were in the room together, but, you know, like I was doing most of the writing. Carol, you know, is like a great joke writer. And we'd be up at a certain point and she'd just have, you know, such a great line somewhere. You know, like when Elaine comes out onto the deck wearing that hat and Jerry goes, then came Maud. You know, like, yeah. you know, that was like Carol. And, you know, she, you know, she's unbelievably funny. And, um, you know, that was the first time I wrote with anybody. And um, I I was like trying to, um, you know, kind of wrestle with uh, what it's like to have to collaborate while writing, you know. It wasn't mm-hmm. easy for me. 
you know, it got it got a lot easier when I when I wrote the um, the betrayal with Dave Mandel. Mm. That was like a breeze. Yeah, the um, that was uh, that was based off a player, right? Is that right? Yeah. Like a... I had seen the I had actually seen the the movie Betrayal with Jeremy Irons and Ben Kingsley. And uh, I was thinking, God, that would make such a great Seinfeld episode to go backwards. And I was, <laughs> that's, that was after I left the show. But, you know, I came back for that one because it was just too good. Did you also come back with, with Larry for the finale at all? Were you in, involved with that? I was there. You know, okay. I was like able to read and everything like that. But I, I was actually um, working my own pilot that, you know, like I had my dream. Oh, that's right. You had, uh, yeah. I mean, they literally had the the table read the next morning after we shot the finale, so I had to leave at like one o'clock. I left at like one o'clock in the morning. I just said to Larry and Jerry, "I said, you know, I gotta, I gotta, gotta go." And it was a great moment because you know, Jerry said, "Here's the baton, run with it," and and Larry said, "God, I feel like I'm sending my, my kid off to college." Yes, <laughs> it, was, it was kind of a nice moment. What did you think of the finale? I liked it more than everybody, I guess. <laughs> we liked it, too. We're, we're, we definitely were fans of it. Um, you know, sometimes I think, like, maybe, you know, just making jokes about a fat guy getting, you know, getting mugged might have been a little step over beyond how bad they've always been. You know, that one might have been a little bit over, over, but you know, I, I don't know, but mm. you know, if it's your final episode, you know, you want them to go over the line and get their comeuppance. And that's what happened. That's fair. Yeah. I don't think, yeah, that didn't bother me as much, but I think rewatching it live, I was, I thought it was okay, but now rewatching it years later, I, I, I do have a, uh, a greater appreciation for it. What, um, what possibly live up to expectations on exactly. that? Exactly. Everyone's got their take on it, you know? Exactly. Um, <clears throat> and, I'm just, and I'm just curious, Peter, like years later, like we've rewatched these years later, I think watching it live, you know, it's it's meaningful. And for the most part, every episode that I love, you know, back in the 90s, I still love today. But for instance, I'll give you one that kind of didn't. It was um, when they killed off Susan. For some reason, I don't know. It didn't it didn't sit well with me this time around versus live. I'm curious if there's any episodes you felt that way as well, and probably not. But I'm just curious if you do. Well, I, I certainly don't agree with you. I'm you know I'm not along along for the ride with you on killing Susan. I mean, I was you like, like that one. I was I was like at the edge of my seat, and I just. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, when they when they're like, oh, and Elaine's like. Like, oh, George, I'm so sorry. And I mean, you know, and then they, well, you want to go for coffee? I don't know. I, it was, I, I love that. I, it was so uncomfortable. That I, you know, I love the really uncomfortable scenes. And, you know, like the, um, the, the uh, alternate side that Bill wrote, you know, the one, you know, the one she, like, feeds yeah, and Jerry soup. doesn't like that. Uh, yeah. To this day, Jerry doesn't. I know. We ranked that. That's one of our favorite episodes. And again, that one, I was like, I was like on the edge of my seat. I just loved it. <laughs> yeah. You know what's Incredible. interesting about the invitations? And uh, I forgot who we were talking to about it. But, you know, I don't know if Larry talked about this with you or with anyone. But, you know, that's his last, that's his last episode. And, you know, he kills off Susan and just like. Now he's off the show. And it's like, did you guys know this was going to happen? It was like, he just basically killed. It was almost like him saying like, I'm out of here. I'm done. Like this, how I'm going to end it. And, you know, what I just always found that fascinating that it was, it was his last show was like, you know, it, George. And I wonder what his actual real wife thought. Of. I don't know. I just these through my head. Like, what, what was he kind of saying? Like, you know, he got the job as if, you know, the, the whole joke is, you know, he got the job so he can get a girl, but already has the girl. And then he kills the girl and then he leaves the job. There's a lot going on there. I don't know if I'm asking a question here or not, but it's very interesting. Yeah, I don't, um, 
I don't re remember, you know, thinking that Larry was definitely going to leave, you know, and I don't, I don't think that was, I mean, you know, maybe, maybe that was in his head, but I don't really know. But I mean, like, I didn't know he was going to leave because every season he would say, that's it, <laughs> you know, and then, you know, then we'd get a, like a couple of weeks of hiatus and, you know, he'd be back. But, um, yeah, uh, you know, there are a lot of factors in, um, in the demise of Susan. Mm. Yeah. Listen, we, we didn't love Susan. The whole season he was, he got, he got engaged and he was trying to get out of it. Right. That's the, that's the, that's and, the, you know, the, the only joke. thing that ended up getting him out of it was his unbelievable cheapness. <laughs> <laughs> well said. So Peter, you know, I'm just curious, like, uh, I know you're a big sports guy and obviously, uh, competitive was there a competition between the writers like you and larry charles i mean i put you guys kind of in the same uh Mount space Rushmore. there um, as far as you know getting kind of the best episodes out there i'm just curious what i know there was no writing room per se but kind of on set was there a friendly competition to get kind of a you know the well, best scripts in front of larry you wanted to get your script produced, you know, and um, I never had any competitiveness, you know, with Larry Charles. He was like, you know, I was new to this and he was like really supportive. I remember him telling me, you know, you want to get as many episodes as you can, you know, this, he, it was so funny. He once said to me, you know, you could, your episode, you know, this was after I wrote my first episode and he goes, you know, the, your episode, the apartment, I mean, you could potentially make fifty thousand dollars off that. <laughs> I'm like fifty thousand dollars. God, if that were true now, I'd be so depressed. Um, <laughs> you know, I never had any competition with him. I, you know, at times, you know, like at the end of season four, the implant was episode nineteen. Now we knew we were going to do the two parter to complete the show within a show, that was going to be episodes 23 and 24. Mm. So there was, a, you know, there was a real race to the finish line to get to who gets episode 22, because that was the opening. And there were, you know, three or four things floating around. And um, I had the smelly car and, and Susan, you know, thinking, and, you know, and Larry had the idea of, Susan being a lesbian and George thinking that he drove her to it. Right. And, um, and, uh, in the end, Larry just, uh, you know, they, we went with, the, we went with the smelly car and, um, I'd be lying if I didn't think, if I didn't feel kind of like exuberant about that, you know, that mm. I kind of, I mean, you know, it was always a good thing to get the last episode of a season, which I did the next year too. I guess the Hamptons was, that, I think that was the last one of that. Season. No, the, uh, the opposite. Oh, the opposite. Yeah. That, but that was the last open one. Yeah. That was the last available slot. The opposite. Because uh, cool. the opposite was Larry, yeah. With the Andy opposite. Cowan. Well, yeah. We spoke with Andy Cowan about that. Um, I mean, obviously, was, Larry had a lot to do with it. <laughs> that was a mistake talking to him. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! <laughs> well, we're talking about. Uh, I got a segue. We're talking about you know writing, and I know you had mentioned this earlier. Uh, last time we spoke with you, I believe how you maybe wrote this in your book, but you basically talk about how you were just kind of gathering, always collecting ideas about from your real life because you you're trying to fit them into the into a story somewhere. Um, what what was your sort of I guess you, you, kind of your your favorite real life happenstance that got into a script and and how did the uh the real people who are involved react when they saw it on, on screen did, did that ever kind of throw them for a loop no i had a friend i had a, I have a my closest friend from college barry landsberg lives out here you know and we're still unbelievably close to this day and you know when i started on the show you know, he's a lawyer you know and he was always like pitching me these ideas 
and um, they were always off. And then he then he tells me about. He says you won't believe it. I went to, I went to um, Tex Mex. It's a restaurant, right? Now, and um, the valet had such bad bo. I can't get it out of the car. He never thought of that as an idea for the show, but I used that. And you know, for years he's been like, yeah, that was my thing. That's what happened to me. That's me. And he also, um, you know, the wife was based on him because he um, he was like the, the the thousandth customer or something like that at a dry cleaner, and they gave him you know a discount on dry cleaning for life. And his girlfriend at the time was just saying was trying to get the wanted to get in on the discount, so she was saying she was Barry's wife <laughs> so that's how that story came about. but yeah barry was a great font for um for stories and you know there's there's the woman i was talking to at my gym one night and a girl walks by uh with significant cleavage and i look and the girl goes oh come on they're fake and that's how the tell terry hatcher episode started at first you know that was going to be just a moment at uh. first i was that would be just a great moment and, you know, like get back to whatever business is going on. Then all of a sudden I was thinking, wait a minute. Oh, that's a story. Yeah. And you're, story. you're, and you're a leg man, right, Peter? <laughs> yeah. I love that joke. <laughs> yeah, that's such because a it's, it's, what do I need legs? Be, I got legs. Right. But that it's like, but though, and you talked about this last time. I mean, it's conversational. It doesn't feel like a bit. And I think that's that's what separates you from a lot of what we saw in later season eight and nine is um, kind of forced bits versus just, you know, natural conversation that's funny. So yeah. um, we take we take our hat off to you for that. Um, so this is our 100th episode. You mentioned this earlier before we're chatting. You put together the Clips episode, which was also the 100th episode of Seinfeld. I'm curious, kind of went into what went into that. How did you get? Uh, how did you take the lead on that? Um, you know, at that time, I had been on the show. I don't know, what, four or five years or whatever. And um, you know, Larry and Jack, it, it you know it was a time-consuming thing. And um, you know, Larry just said Melman should do it. And so. Um, so I spent a lot of time, you know, and I tried to find a way of, you know, categorizing and organizing it. And then, you know, it's like, you know, then it's, I don't want to short shrift this writer or that writer. So you want to get some of their stuff in there mm -hmm. and, you know, you want, and everybody's got an opinion on what's the best thing and what's not, what's great and what's not, and what should be there and what isn't. And, um, you know, like Larry sees the cut of it, and he goes, "What about the uh, this scene?" And I finally just said to him, "Look, Larry, you know, we I could be doing this for the rest of my life." <laughs> you know? And he laughed and he said, "Yeah, I get it." And um, you know, he saw it. And, you know, he called me the night that it aired and said, "God, it was so good." You know? And you know, it was fun, and uh, you know, but kind of the thing that was good about it for me is that, you know, it was, it really kind of crystallized what I like in the show, you know, the kind of things that I like in the show. And, you know, so it was all my taste, which was, you know, very pleasant, you know? Yeah. I mean, I like it more than the, than the, than the, the one they do at the end, you know, they do another sort of, yeah. kind of montage thing towards the end before the finale. I thought the 100th one is, is actually way better. I mean, it, it may be because it covered the episodes I like, but like to your point, it had that the themes and the way it was cut and, you know, each of the, a lot of the relationship talk that we love, um, you know, your con the conversation with, with, with George and Jerry about, you know, in the Virgin, when he's trying to figure out if he has a, uh, a girlfriend, you're on a semi daily you got Tampax and moisturizer in you, you know, that, that, that's like the essence of the show right there. You know, those, those guys just kind of talking about, you know, that I just, I, I just watched, rewatched that again before you came on. It's just, you know, that kind of, um, I mean, I'm assuming a lot of your episodes had to do with those relate like relationships. Um, were you at that time, um, 
you know, is that, was that a lot of your life dating kind of like a sim, like were you, were you kind of in that world and that's just the way it came about or you were just drawing from past experience. I mean, it was a lot of relationships going on a lot of, um, I don't know, you know, th- that's what a lot of your, your themes were, I guess is, is the question. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> relationship stories, people never get enough of relationship stories in that show. You know, I mean, um, I was doing a lot of dating and um, and I was cherry picking from, you know, dating in New York and things like that. Um, but um, yeah, I, you know, I, I just like the stories, you know, and, and the, I think the great thing about relationship stories is that, you know, Jerry and George are guys who like no matter what you know like george in one early episode says look i know less about women than anyone in the world <laughs> you know <laughs> that that was in the deal which is like the greatest scene of all time right and um so if you're in a relationship story and jerry was basically the same way at least i knew that they would have to have this great conversation to figure out what's going on right right yeah, those conversations are the essence of the show. That's that's kind of how I look at it. Yeah, that's why. Like in, in the later, in some of the later episodes, you know, when they got so big and so complicated, there was no room for those conversations. You know, like every scene, you know, there were episodes where it started feeling like every scene was like twelve seconds long. That's a good point. You know, and I and you know that I think that's why I purposely wanted in the th- in the thing with their where George is leaving a tape recorder in the attache case, you know, doing the Jerry Lewis trick, you know, like I purposely wanted to rewind that tape, <laughs> you know, and right, leave they just, they're waiting. Uh, yeah. You know, it was like a full 12 seconds of rewinding okay. that tape where they don't say anything. I don't know. It was like, to me, that was like opening my lungs, you know, like, ah, oh. let it breathe yeah. a little. Yeah. That's great. You could, you could tell your fingerprints were on that one. So how does it like a guy from the Washington Post like sitcoms back then, right? It's like Cheers, The Cosby Show, Golden Girls. Like, do you? I don't know. Did you watch those? Like, how do you how do you come up with a script, right? Like, it's got to be twenty two minutes long, right? Like, where do you start? Was it just kind of framework and you filled in with lines, like, or did you always overwrite, or did things have to be filled in? I was just always curious, like, how you pack that all into twenty two minutes. Well, first of all, on Seinfeld, our first drafts, or and even the table read drafts, were always really long, way over 22 minutes. I mean, in, okay. the, implant, in the implant cut seven minutes out of, we, we from the first edit, we cut seven minutes out. Really? What? Oh, wow. I'd love to see that. Man, I'd love to see that. Yeah, what <laughs> didn't make it that you wish did? No, I don't really remember. You know, you wouldn't believe how much you could cut just, you know, like small bits. Yes. Here and there. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed on Netflix, I think they kept some of those smaller ones in on some of yeah. these rewatches. But, you know, like when the, the contest was like nine minutes long. Mm. Really? And, yeah. The contest was like incredible. I think that was the longest one ever. And, um, you know, it's funny in the Hamptons, we were down to like, we were down to like 15 seconds and couldn't find the 15 seconds we had to get out. We got crazy. And, and I said, uh, well, maybe we could just cut the whole bit about how tomatoes never took off as a hand fruit. And Jerry and Larry looked at me like I was out of my mind. <laughs> we are not touching that. And, you know, I wrote that as kind of just like, an, you know, I threw that. I felt like that was a throw-in for me. And I was like, okay, I didn't realize. You know, that's the, that's the scariest thing about comedy. Yeah. That you have no idea what's funny sometimes. I mean, you know, you, you think it's funny. Yeah, and, it blows me away all the time. Editing is the craziest thing, man. When I used to try and write, I could never edit because I just, you don't want to, you don't know what you're taking out. I mean... You hear about these musicians who have like 400 versions of a song and you're like, how do they know which one to use? Same thing with comedies. Like you said, you have all these jokes, you have all these lines. 
Yeah, it's 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 really harrowing at times. Um, but you know, to, to just you know to get it down, you know, I mean, yada yada was you know aired at twenty five minutes. You know, we got three. Yeah, extra, that one. We got three minutes and twenty seconds extra from the network. Wow, that's how much we didn't want to cut anything. And the show was so huge then that they sure run over to the next, run over onto the next show. Who cares? <laughs> All right. So I'll ask you this, Peter. Saturday night, you're flipping through the channel to see Yada Yada on Comedy Central and uh, the Hamptons on Channel 11. Which one are you stopping on? Yada Yada Hamptons. Um, hmm, tough call. Probably the hand. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I didn't give you the imp You would have said the implant for sure, right? You know what I love about the Hamptons is that it's like a French farce. You know, like people going. It's a board, like a like a bedroom comedy. You know, people are coming in and out of doors and everything. Yeah, like. it's got that like three is company vibe or something. I don't know, yeah. like like a lot of miss in and out. They go and they go to the baby's room. They go, you know, they. They're going into the wrong rooms and things. I, I just, I, I love the kind of the whole feel of that Hamptons house. And it was a beautiful. That was it. Thomas. Was Hart that all? Set. Was that all in your head or was that like a Larry David Sharonis, like uh, putting that together with you? I had that. You mean the set? Yeah, yeah, just the whole like set vibe. and the in and out. Like, did you kind of write that or was that kind of a collaboration with the director? Um, well, no, it was, it's all written, you know, it's all written then, but, um, you know, I did some, you know, some with Larry on that, you know, I mean, just the shrinkage thing. I, I don't know if I told you this, but, you know, I was having a little trouble with that story and, and Larry, I walked over to the set because I, when I was having trouble, I would walk around a lot. I walk over to the set and Larry just says, I got a thought for you. What if, uh, what if George goes into the pool and, uh, she sees him, and he, it's cold, and she, uh, Jerry's girlfriend sees him naked. And I'm thinking, and I said to Larry, oh, you mean like shrinkage? And Larry goes, yeah, shrinkage, and use that word. <laughs> <laughs> yes. so that's how fireproof confidence Larry has in what he thinks is funny, you know, like right there, shrinkage, yes, and use that word a lot. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't even imagine speaking of, like with Larry, how often, um, you know, that must have happened. You, you know, whether it was your script or somebody else's, where it was almost just like one, one quick, one, one line changed it all. Like he, you got, you came up with shrinkage. He led you to it, and then he knew, you know, yes, use it a lot. Like it's just, uh, that's it's collaborative. Like, that's yeah. collaborative at its best. Right, right, exactly. Lightning in a bottle. That's incredible. Fantastic yeah. collaboration. You know, you just love, you know. And, um, you know, I wish I had come up with, I wish I had totally come up with the idea myself. But, you know, like, that's, it's a, it's a very, comedy is a much more collaborative process than, you know, than writing for a newspaper, you know. <laughs> and that's literally... Uh, you kind of walking into Larry's office, like with a pen and paper, like where you might be struggling with something, and that's where you, the collaboration happens. Or uh, yeah. at what point does that happen? Yeah, anytime. You know, it was so casual there. It wasn't like any other show. You know, it was like it, it was like it was almost like the house in the Hamptons. You know, you just like walk into people's <laughs> office and go, "What do you think of this?" And you know, like you'd walk in and out of rooms and offices and. And into Jerry's office and Larry's office, and you know, it just it, yeah. it was very casual. You know, it wasn't. <clears throat> it, like, it seemed uh, like you know, even uh, even on even during like rehearsals and even during shooting on set. I mean, we talked to Dan Cortez about the stall episode, and he told us that Larry, you know, kind of came up to him and was like, "What a what a guy what a guy say like what would an MTV guy say?" And like Cortez like gave him a couple and step off was one of them, and Larry's like, "Yep, use it." You know, just asking asking Dan Cortez almost to kind of to, to kind of collaborate right there on on the set while they're shooting and leaving it up to the guest stars, even which is incredible. I would think for for an actor to to have that sort of you know back and forth with with the creator of the show. Um, <clears throat> like, yeah, I think that was like a you know it was a very 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 happy set 
all the mm. time, very loose. And, you know, you could, I mean, it was crazy how loose it was. I mean, when in season four, you know, when the show got really popular, on show night, we would have, you know, the stands would be full and the floor would be packed with people. Friends of people could, oh, sure, come on, just hang out on the floor. Or at all the agents in town, come on, would just come and they'd just be hanging out on the floor. That was just like no other show where where total people who weren't involved in the show were just able, were allowed to just be milling around. You know, my friend Barry Landsberg, who I mentioned, I remember his brother was in town and he got to see the filming of the contest. He was on the floor. I mean, this wow. is a guy who at the time was like living on 75th Street in Manhattan. <laughs> and he just happened to be out here. And I'm sure, come on down. I'll watch the show. I'll put your name at the front gate. You just walk in the side. You know, I mean, it was so different and crazy. And then I remember like after the season, they Castle Rock was shooting another pilot. And there was another director there, and our but they were using our entire crew. There was this other director who had done a bunch of Murphy Browns, and um, I walked on the set because you know we were editing still. I walked on the set, and I'm just kidding around with some of the people from the show, you know, who were working on the show. And the guy starts screaming at me to shut up. <laughs> you know, he just started yelling at me. Um, oh, I always forget the guy, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think Sharon is, you know, kind of got worn down. <laughs> you know, like he wasn't allowed to feel like he was the like director and like god of the set. He just, you know, and then Andy Ackerman is just such a low key great guy that it was never a problem. You know, like Andy is just so easygoing, and he just, you know, throw people around, great, you know. <laughs> oh it, wow! Yeah, those people on the stage. It it was like a play, it became it started feeling like it was a playoff game. You know, there was like so much excitement on the set, and you know, like the laughs were like triple because you know there were so many more people than a normal audience. And, you know that that bit with Elaine and the and the diaphragm. I mean, the laughs were like endless. It was great. Yeah, we we had a uh, yeah. I mean, doing a hundred of these episodes, like we feel like we've we're still chronically in this show. I mean, we talked about Hazel, who would kind of do stand up right during the uh, yeah. kicking off, and we spoke with Ann Tallman, who dated Michael Richards, and Pat Hazel was asking for advice on what they should call you know Dolores, and she yelled out Mulva or no Mulva, and she yelled out Dolores, and like. It's incredible how all these ideas came together, to your point, like on this small, close-knit set. It was just... Uh, and that was a small yeah. stage. You know, we had, that year we had a much smaller stage. You know, Back, got, oh, season three, four, five, yeah. The first, you know, in seasons two, three, and four, or, you know, we were on stage 19. And then after that, we moved to season nine was a really big set and for a while we were like worried because it just didn't seem like we were getting the laughs you know it's almost like you know like like the Dallas Cowboys now seem to have no home field advantage because that stadium <laughs> is so gigantic yeah, it's atrocious <clears throat> <laughs> yeah I wonder I wonder if if the um I'm, I'm assuming it was it's the bottom line is, is money but you know the later seasons there was also more episodes, um, you know, two and three, I think were, were shorter. And then, you know, by four or five, they started getting into the twenties as far as number of episodes, but, um, three was the first season where there was 22. Yeah. So like, I'm, I'm guessing, um, you know, the pressure must've been there for, to kind of fill those slots and, and, uh, and maybe that was kind of felt, throughout I, I don't know if there was if it was trickled down to the writers as far as like we need more stuff from you guys or it was just kind of just like by that point it was already a well-oiled machine i mean i'm assuming there was more writers towards the end as well uh, i don't know but just from remembering credits and things like that it seemed like there was more oh yeah i mean you know in season four they were really it was 
really four writers, if you think about it. It was Larry, Larry Charles, me, and then the four comedians, you know, Bill, Bob, John Heyman, and, and Steve Scrovan were kind of like one writer. They were basically <laughs> there to come up with ideas. You know, right. they weren't originally go. They were just there to generate ideas. So, um, yeah, and then, you know, then, you know, we, the next year, I think we, was the first year Tom and Max were on. And then once you have two Harvard guys, you know, by the next season, you have 12, you know, because they kind of. <laughs> why, why did, um, why did Larry Charles leave after season five? Same kind of deal with Sharon, like he just had enough or. Oh, no, no, no. He got a, he got a big development deal. He was offered a big deal with um, maybe Columbia or something like that. But, you know, he got offered a deal to create his own show, so, you know, development deal. And, you know, Larry had been in the business for a long time. And this was like, you know, he was doing great stuff on Seinfeld. But, you know, all of a sudden they're saying, you know, here's a, here's a, a, a three-year deal, you know, for whatever million dollars a year. You know, I mean... And yeah. so, uh, you know, he was a guy with a, a family, you know, three kids, two or three kids at that point, and, you know, a house and everything like that. And, you know, it was his time to cash in, you know? Yeah, like a coordinator getting a head coach job, I guess. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, he, yeah, exactly. Mm. You know, I stayed on. And, I mean, you know, I really wanted to be there for the end, but. Then again, you know, I knew that the ninth season nine would probably be it. And I was thinking, you know, like, and I already had a DreamWorks deal. Right. You know, I pushed back two years. You know, I pushed back my deal, two, my DreamWorks deal, two years to stay on Seinfeld. And um, I just kind of figured after season eight, you know, like if this was going to, if the next one was going to be the last season, I didn't feel like being like one of 10 Seinfeld writers out there pitching shows, you know? <laughs> so I just thought, you know, yada, yada seemed like a really good place to get out on. Yeah. Yeah. You, uh, you certainly went out on top for sure. So now that it's on Netflix is like, is there a bigger, um, I guess, wave of fans that you kind of have been interacting with i'm just curious how how seinfeld's changed over the years and now that it's on netflix if you've seen a bigger impact uh in your life um not really but i hear a lot of people saying that they've started watching it with their kids yeah like it's a big thing of parents watching with their kids which is kind of which is really cool yeah, we get that a lot with the guest stars too. They they talk about what their kids are now watching and they're like in their twenties and things like that. So we're trying to get them to listen to us. They're not. I don't know where where those where those twenty million people are. <laughs> oh, Howard thinks the numbers were fudged on the Nielsen ratings because we don't have enough people listening to this. Yeah, and you know, I mean, like Stephanie Kennedy, you know, she was wardrobe. Yes. Yeah. Um, you really should interview her. Right. We did. Yeah, we talked to Stephanie. Yeah. You did, you did, right. I, you know, she told me that she's done some interviews. Yeah, she, you know, she, um, you know, her kids, she watches with her kids all the time. Yeah, some of it's a little, you know, I got younger ones and I, I just started off with the Pez dispenser just to keep it, uh, keep it clean, you know. Um, yeah. The Pez dispenser. Is good. <laughs> I tell my kids bedtime stories based on Seinfeld plots. <laughs> I love the Pez dispenser. You got a hand, you're going to need it. And uh, who's intervening? That's a great lie. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, been incredible episodes. And Peter, obviously, you've been a, just an integral part of all that. And we just can't thank you enough. We're honored to have you on our 100th episode. And um, hopefully we'll do 100 more. Thank you, honor all I really appreciate you guys asking me. Thank you, Peter. This was awesome. Okay. Thanks again for joining for the second time. <laughs> and go, uh, yeah, go, go take care of Masters on the golf course tomorrow. I suck. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Peter. <laughs>